community. We uh, really appreciate it. You guys are great to be with, and it's always fun to be in Dublin. This is my second trip, but I made sure Kyoko came along this time because uh, I enjoyed it so much last year, um, including the parade that I think is tomorrow. Right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm here to talk about storytelling in Hollywood. Uh, a little bit um, based on ideas that are in this book of mine and and also a book on writing treatments, both of which are available as ebooks as well. And um, what I'm showing you today is something that you never get to see. Uh, and it's one of the strangest things in the world that writers don't get to see it because it determines their fate completely in Hollywood. And it's an animal called the coverage. Um, what, what happens when anything is submitted for consideration for a film or television is that it goes to the story department of the agency or producer or studio or broadcaster that uh, you're sending it to and the story department gives it to a story editor who is a reader uh, an analytical reader and that reader creates a document called the coverage and the coverage is then turned back to the executive to whom the story was submitted. And he reads the cover coverage and decides your fate based on what the coverage recommends. Uh, that's not completely true, but it's about 90% true in the sense that there are always fluke accidents. And one of the huge exceptions is if you get to pitch your story, as some of you will be doing tomorrow when during the pitch sessions. Because a pitch is a live presentation of a story, whereas most of the time when people are submitting, they're submitting a novel or a treatment or a script to Hollywood. And when that happens, it goes to the story department. Why? Because it takes a long time to read a novel. I, I try to read, you know, read all the time, but I can still never find more than an hour a day to read. So I got an email two nights ago from a client that said, please put this at the top of your pile. But my pile is very high, and it already has several things on the top from other clients who said, please put this on the top of their pile. And suddenly this guy comes in with his story, and he wants it on the top of the pile. But it doesn't work that way, because unfortunately, as human beings, we're all handicapped by the same handicap, which is limitation of time. And we all know that in today's world where we're being bombarded. So the story department is to make it possible to get an intelligent coverage, we hope, um, uh, on a story. And the, the producer or studio that, that hires the story editor will hire that person based on similarity of taste and based on their, their, uh, you know, their correspondence, like whether your tastes correspond with mine. If, if I have several readers working for us as we do through an internship program, then we, we select the readers after four months or five months of internship that are doing the best coverages and ones that we agree with. Uh, there's really no training courses other than internships in Hollywood, but this is how coverage evolves into a story, someone becoming a story editor and then reading stories and reporting to them. So what I'm gonna show you today, because the big catch 22 about coverages is that you, the writer, who has the most stake in this whole situation, never sees the coverage. The coverage is an internal document that is not meant for eyes outside the company. And uh, so what I decided to do today was to actually just show you a coverage, a real coverage, uh, with the name blocked out of the writer and the name blocked out of the person who wrote the coverage, but a coverage done for my company to show you what a coverage is like. And this, this gives you the idea of what you're up against. You know what you we need to do right so let me push the button and see if it clicks it does that's great so you can see the coverage um, has all this information on it um, I guess we didn't block out the person who wrote the coverage he's one of our best and he's moved on from being an intern to being a story editor now um, and um, it has the you know it, 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 you're supposed to circle whether it's a book or a script um, or you'll write in its treatment. And then you, you see, the first thing that happens is the score of the coverage. And this one says consider with development. And the other categories are consider, period, which means it doesn't need much development. Consider with development. Uh, pass, which means no. 
Uh, and it's interesting in the, in the book world where we also work, it's called a rejection. <laughs> but Hollywood never uses the word rejection because to make it in Hollywood, you, you have to be so persistent and so hard nosed and so tough skinned that the word rejection means nothing to you. I mean, because I sell stories of story merchant, that's what I do for a living. I get rejected 20 times a day and it's like, I don't even feel the pain anymore. <laughs> but that took a lifetime of, you know, of being no, 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 no. And when it comes to things like rejection, the best thing I can offer you is my, the, the following scenario. There is a big blackboard in the sky that has every single no you're ever going to receive on it. And uh, at the end, there's a yes. <laughs> the only catch, as we all know, is you can't see this blackboard. You know, it's invisible to us mere humans, right? So if you think about that logically, there's only one way to proceed. That is to get all of your no's as fast as you can. Because there is a yes waiting there, and most of the people who never get published or never get produced don't because they stop. They get disheartened by these no's when in fact no's are the, the very spice of life and the things that make strong people and strong writers. So uh, just keep that in mind. And Hollywood never used the word rejection because we know in Hollywood you never know what's going to happen. I mean today's no is tomorrow's yes and therefore we don't use the word no. Uh, the most no-ish thing you'll ever hear is the door is always open to you. <laughs> and that means, that doesn't mean no, it just means we're not going to say no to you. Uh, and when people are always puzzled, they go to Los Angeles, they somehow trick their way into a couple of meetings, people are extremely nice and positive, and then they never hear from anyone again. Uh, and that's simply because the time wasn't right for your story. And a lot of story selling is about timing. It's not about anything else, it's about timing. Uh, for example, if you're going to bring a, a story about, you know, a woman or a man dealing with a giant sea monster to Hollywood and three movies like that are in development in different studios and one just came out a year ago, this is bad timing for your story. Uh, and so therefore you can't take it personally. You just have to get through those notes as quickly as you can in order to find the right moment and the right uh, answer. So you'll see it analyzes things. It tells you, tells us that it's a mystery drama. And then there is a log line, a warm weather life shaken out of her quiet country life when their neighbor is found dead, etc. The log line is telling the whole story in one sentence. And the shorter the sentence, the better. If you can make the sentence extremely short, uh, there's a good chance that the executive will go on to the next page and keep reading. Because the shorter it is, the more likely it is to sell. And, uh, you know, he was left alone on Mars. That's a short log line. And it's an example of what we call a high concept. A concept that is so high that a stupid person could understand it. As a former professor, it took me 10 years to figure out what the word high concept meant. And it means basically the opposite of the term. It means a concept so lowbrow that everyone can get it, that you can tell it to your dimmest friend on the phone in 10 seconds, and they'll get it. You know, oh, I gotta go see that girl on a train. You know, she looks out the window and her life changes forever. Uh, that's the high concept, simply put. The movie wasn't as good as the book, I thought. Anyway, so let's keep going. Then there's a synopsis, the only time in Hollywood you'll ever see that. Uh, phrase because we stay away from that phrase. We talk about pitches, but not synopsis. Synopsis is kind of an academic term, but it's an industrial term too. And the purpose of this is to tell me, the exec reading it, what the whole story is in very brief time. Like this one is okay. This is this is what it's supposed to be. One page. Sometimes they're two pages. If it's three pages, I don't read it. I send it, give it back to my assistant, and tell her to ask the the coverage writer to write a one or two page synopsis. If you can't condense a story down to one page, chances are it's not a commercial story that can be sold at all. And when writers say, well, I really have time writing short. Well, of course, everyone does. Think about advertising writers. They've got 30 seconds to tell their story. And yet the best ones tell a compelling story in 30 seconds. 
sure, the easy part is to write 300 pages. The hard part is to write, you know, the overview of those 300 pages in a way that makes somebody else want to read 300 pages. So that's what the synopsis is. Overall, this is an overall assessment of the story, uh, an opinion of the story on the part of the editor. And this is where it takes trust to develop between the executive and the editor, because if I normally agree with this person's opinion at the beginning of the process when you are training them, you read part of the manuscript as well as is their coverage and, and see if you agree with it. And when you start to learn to trust the reader, you can also be giving them feedback and say, you're being too harsh, you're worrying about the wrong things, et cetera, until they get the knack of it. And then um, market potential. Uh, this you can see for yourself. And you know it, it makes it clear, you know where there is a market for this, and then uh, then we divide the rest of the coverage into certain elements that we're all familiar with in fiction and storytelling, uh, and this applies to nonfiction as well because as far as Hollywood is concerned, nonfiction is also a story. Everything is stories. I mean, as a story merchant, I long ago learned to believe in the power of stories because they either can change the world or they can. Uh, entertain you and uplift you and inspire you or both and uh, everyone needs stories no matter what walk of life you're in if you're an attorney in front of a judge and jury if you tell a better story than the other attorney you win you know if you're an advertise if you're a salesman and you're trying to sell someone a car it's going to be your story that they believe in if you're on a first date you know, and you get the reaction, ah, I, never, I didn't really believe his story. I couldn't buy his story. But we all know how that is. And when a doctor um, is examining a patient, I'm, I had one doctor said this to me three years ago, I, you know, everything is normal, but I don't, I don't like your story. So I needed to go have another checkup. And I thought, interesting, even in medicine, stories are what people really listen for. It helps them figure out what's going on. So, um, we go into structure first, and then uh, a heart, the heart of the coverage really is what the conflict is. And uh, the conflict is usually analyzed in terms of the protagonist conflict, like what kind of conflict the main person has, but also the antagonist and what their conflict is, both external conflict and internal conflict. So you can see how that's laid out. And then um, the next stage is the character itself and how they're built, whether they're well built, whether they're memorable, because someone uh, looking to make a movie needs to know that they're that this is a castable movie because cast what makes people want to go to a movie. Other than the log line, the, the, the three word pitch or the one sentence pitch, the next thing you look at is who's in it. And that won't happen unless the character is so interesting and well built that a star or an important actor will want to be in it. And then the dialogue. Uh, dialogue obviously is hugely important in, in, in movie stories. And I urge it to that you put it in your novels too. In fact, I used to give a, a workshop called Write Your Novel, Plan Your Novel to Be a Film. Because films are so different from novels because films are entirely reliant on drama. And novels can go off into philosophy and contemplation and rumination and all those other things that are more leisurely. But in today's world, especially, drama has to be all dialogue and all action. We always say in, in court film courses, there are two kinds of action. One of them is actual action. She slapped him in the face. The other one is dialogue. Would you please, 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 please stop talking. <laughs> I mean, that, that, there's a piece of active dialogue. Things like, good morning, how are you doing? None of that belongs in a film script. Uh, every piece of that dialogue needs to move a story forward. So in the coverage, the dialogue is analyzed. The pacing of the story is analyzed to see if it has twists and turns and whether it keeps moving in a roller coaster-like way, whether act one, two, and three are well-defined and so on. In my, my treatment book, uh, we, we have a whole outline in a chart to show you how to or make sure that your story is uh, filled with good pacing. And if your novel is not as well paced, 
Then what you do is you write a treatment and uh, make fix all the problems that were in your novel in the treatment so that you submit the treatment to Hollywood instead of submitting the novel. You understand that it just it's a way of tricking the market in, and then in fact, I sold this a movie three years ago that I uh, had been unable to sell because people I was trying to sell the novel. And I realized the novel just had a lot of problems in it. So my partner and I just wrote a treatment and, and sold the treatment. And then, of course, before the deal was closed, they wanted to read the novel. And I said, no, 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 you don't have to read the novel. Just, you know, it's based on the novel. You'll get the rights to the novel, but the treatment. So needless to say, they, they insisted on reading the novel, and then they because I knew them, called back and said, you're right, you're right, we're, we're going to do the story in the treatment and we'll use the novel for kind of a, a mine to go in and mine details that we might find useful. But treatments is, is a way around, it's a shortcut to, to get your novel in compliance or your nonfiction book. And then the logic of the story kind of speaks for itself. Um, points holes in the story, these are kind of minor holes. Um, but in this case, and then the craft of the story, a comment on that, because uh, a book in which craft is missing uh, is it's not a good sign to that it'll be turned into a movie. And that's it. All right. So I don't know how much time I have, but I, I'd love to answer questions for a few minutes. And, but, and, and see, the thing about this coverage, and I think we have, did you make an offer people can do a coverage? Uh, get a coverage done or not? Uh, no, I mean, we're going to do a pitch session tomorrow. Okay, so pitch session. We'll talk about that. In the pitch session. Yeah. But anyway, um, as I mentioned, the problem with the coverage is that you never get to see it. This document, which is usually the basis of a decision, uh, is something that you're not, it's not shared with you. And that's for a simple and perfectly good business reason. When you submit something to Hollywood, you're not asking for criticism. You know, it would be kind of rude, from our point of view, to offer you criticism when you didn't ask for it. You asked us to buy it. You know, you just said, you're looking for a yes or a no. You're not looking for a raft of, you know, uh, issues about your story. But when you get the no, which is called a pass, not a no, not right for us right now kind of thing, uh, you're going to be dying of curiosity. I wonder what, you know, what the problem was. And the answer is usually in the files of the company because, uh, and one of the dangerous things about Hollywood is that coverages uh, with big companies like broadcasters and studios are all computerized and shared because of the deviousness of human nature. The first thing an assistant does or a story editor does who's writing a coverage for, say, Warner Brothers is to check on the, the secret networks that the assistants put up and to see whether someone else has already covered it. Uh, sometimes they do their coverage first, but they don't want to be fired by doing a stupid coverage of something that everyone else in town is raving about. So they go and check what are called the tracking boards, and they'll see that this story has already been covered at three other studios, and all of them are passing. Or they'll see that two other studios are considering it, in which case they'll take another look at what they wrote and, and make it less, you know, <coughs> definitive than their first draft. And, you know, that's not, it's kind of not fair to writers. I used to think, because I'm so old, but, you know, in, in today's generation, it's normal. Just as a, a heinous invention that is now completely de rigueur in the book business, book scan. Like, if you're selling your agent on the idea that your book did really pretty well and, and actually thousands and thousands of copies were sold, uh, guess what? Bookscan will tell them exactly how many copies were sold at bookstores uh, and by, by the data that comes from cash registers. And the reason it takes you so long to check out at the bookstore is that the cash register is collecting all kinds of information that shouldn't be collecting from you know an old timer's perspective. You used to be able to uh, fudge story a little bit in favor of the writer. And now there's no fudging allowed because you're they're getting the information from Bookscan even as you talk to them on the phone. You know, as you're pitching it to them on the phone, they're checking Bookscan. 
and they're going, well, I don't know, it says here 120 copies were sold. <laughs> How does that mean thousands? And uh, so this is the world we're living in. It's You have to become knowledgeable about the world. And writers who say, you know, I'm just a writer, I don't do any marketing, I kind of shake my head and I think, well, you're not going to make it. It will be a complete miracle if you make it. Because Going back to the times of Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, the reason these names are known to us is because they were all marketers. Not only were they great dramatists, Aristophanes, they were marketers. And guess what? Shakespeare was such a good marketer, he talked the Queen into building the Globe Theater. And guess whose plays dominated the Globe Theater? You know, five minutes so we had 44 plays of Shakespeare. And, and we know a few other names, but they weren't in the Globe Theater as much as his, so they never reached his level of fame, just like Euripides. So th this has always been true, that the people who market their own books, I mean, look at 19th century British novelists, and you'll see 10 people out of the top 12 who, did, who published their own books first, including Jane Austen and Thomas Hardy, et cetera. Uh, they did their own publishing because they believed in themselves enough. So there's no shame in believing in yourself. I mean, if you've got that problem, somebody needs to kind of smack some sense into you uh, so you can wake up. If you're a storyteller, you're, you're born to tell your story. Don't hide it under a bushel, unless you want to. If, if that's what you want to do, fine, but then don't complain. So, any questions? Yes, sir. If um, you have an idea for a TV show or movie, or a chapter of the book, uh, how do you protect that idea? And the other question would be, how deep does a TV show treatment have to be? Well, that's a very good question. And as far as protection goes, um, there are legal ways to protect it. The two are the copyright office and whatever country you're in, we're all part of, except China, part of the Geneva Accords, which protect copyright internationally. And you need to file, you, you know, file that at some point. But uh, the Writers Guild of America. Uh, which is online, offers a protection device that is probably the very best to use. You simply pay, I think it's $35 now, and you register your story with them, and then you put it at the front of the story, you know, Writers Guild of America West registration number X and Y, which they give you when you file it. You can file electronically, you can pay electronically, and uh, what, what that does, it doesn't protect you, but as an attorney would say, you know, it, it's evidence. And if you're the first one who filed to be for that protection, you know, you can then produce the filing and say, January 11th, I filed this. This other guy who published the same story didn't file it until two years later, et cetera. So then you've got the attention of, you know, a judge. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that very much because the hard thing is not it's about stealing stories and getting your story safe. The hard thing is selling the story. And uh, sometimes it's better to have a story stolen because it's so awful anyway. And the, novel, the novelist John, John Gardner was my mentor editorially. And he told me one day when this alligator movie came out, he said, I went to see it secretly because I had written the same story. And I walked out and almost fell to my knees, thanking God that I did not have anything to do with that story because it would have been a massive lifelong embarrassment. Um, and, and that's and he said, my feeling is just keep moving fast and my speed will be, you know, beat anyone else. That's the way I think you should look at that whole issue. But when it comes to what was the second question? How in depth is the truth? Yeah, if you're writing a proposal for a series. Like if you've written six mysteries or six adventure novels and they're linked by a character, then you've got a series proposal and it's, it's called a series bible. And they range from 20 to 30 pages, uh, dividing the series up into episodes. Eight is a good number for today's world. They're called, it's called a limited series. Uh, and you know all about them from the fact that you too have 40 channels uh, that offer drama or more channel, depending on what country you're in, but right now there is an insatiable need for that kind of a story. And uh, when you write a Bible, uh, the Bible, it's called a Bible with a small b, it, it lays out the characters, it lays out the action, it lays out what happens in each episode, it gives you an idea of what the second season could be, the third season, etc. And um, 
that's what you need for that. If, when it comes to a, a movie, a television movie, you, you a treatment will do, and a treatment ranges from five to 20 pages. The shorter, the better, because of our attention span problem uh, and, and pressure, time pressure problem. Yes, ma'am. Um, you have found that you can understand the actual dialogue well, because prose is, is usually what turns into action lines and, and scripts, and, and you are evaluating the novel because I mean, in, our, in our case especially, our, our company represents novels to publishers, but it also publishes novels. Um, in today's world, it's extremely hard for a new novelist to be published by a traditional publisher. So we, we came up with four years ago story version books to allow new voices to get out there. Then I can carry a book with me to a Hollywood meeting and sell the book, even though it's not published by Random House. It, they don't really care. They just care. Does it look like a book? And, and, and I might warn you that a lot of self-published books look like not books. They don't look like books. And, and you, you really need to make your book look like a book and read like a book. And so our, our coverage people let us know what they think of the writing, the prose itself, too. Yes, you no, no, oh, sorry. Good. You next. No. Go ahead. Thanks very much. That's fascinating. I'm just wondering, uh, the stuff on those slides is wonderful. Could you make it available to me? No, I really can't because, you know, it is based on a real story, and I would feel like it. I don't think you're going to memorize it here while you're sitting here, and I didn't see any flash bulbs go off. So I, I, just to protect the client, I can't make it available. Okay. Yes. Malcolm Gladwell had something similar to what you talked about, a, a computer program for scripts for movies. But the uh, when people come to you and you rate their books and all that, does Hollywood have the same sort of thing set up for agencies that come to them? What do you, what do you mean, agencies? Meaning, uh, uh, would they even allow you or other companies to come in to pitch things to them? Would do they, they do, do they do a Hollywood? coverage of you? Pardon me? Do they do a coverage of your agency? <laughs> uh, well, the coverage is, is more brutal than that. It's like they just don't return your phone call. Because okay? <laughs> you know, I have lunch with people, and I've been having lunch with for 30 years now. And uh, you know, if I'm not getting a call back, that means I'm no longer on their lunch list, right? But um, and, and that's that's the review thing. But normally that. We get a chance to go in and pitch, and there's a whole ritual to a pitch lunch or a pitch meeting. It starts with casual conversation, and you know, what are you working on now? And then I mentioned something I'm just recently excited about, and then maybe another two things, and then you get to the focus of the meeting, which is what you came to pitch them, and you go into that pitch, but you can tell by their eyes whether they're interested or not. Like if you start to see the glazed look on their eyes, then that means. Forget about it. And it doesn't matter why. If you're a salesman, it doesn't matter why. You could have a hundred reasons for not wanting, wanting to buy a vacuum sleeper, but who cares? Hearing their reasons is a waste of time. So what, what you then have is a couple of backup pitches that you that you can bring into play at that point when somebody has clearly indicated no interest. They are interested. They're not shy. Because all of the people that we deal with are people who want to buy stories. They don't need to buy stories because they're bombarded with stories, but they want to find a story that excites them. And the minute they hear it, they'll start asking you questions, and the pitch kind of then takes over its own energy because they're asking the questions. And what happens, you know, you might be three minutes into the pitch and they say, What happens at the end? And you tell them that because they're, they don't, you know, their brain is putting it together. They need much less. So if you're pitching me tomorrow, Please don't read anything to me. If you can't tell your story to me, then you don't know your story. You shouldn't be pitching it yet. I once actually at HBO had a client kicked out of the chairman's office because he insisted on bringing three by five cards with him 
And after we, Warner Brothers is my partner, and after we had trained him, you know, coached him in three different meetings to just pitch it to this guy, he said, okay. But then he pulled out the three by five cards, and the chairman looked at it and said, what are those? And he said, they're cards. And he said, what for? He said, just to make sure I don't forget something. He goes, wait a minute. You wrote the story? You published the novel? And you can't even tell me the story? Get out of my office. I got to sell the story to 20 million viewers. And, and if I have to use three by five cards, it's not going to happen. And, and I, you know, I learned from that years ago that if you can't tell your story, there's something wrong with this picture. Uh, you're just not ready yet. Just come back when you can tell it. Can I ask something? We have some people who are going to pitch tomorrow. So could you, as a wrap to this session, could you give some advice on how to do a quick pitch? What would you be looking for tomorrow? I would be looking at your eyes and your enthusiasm, and you're immediately telling me what your story is about. Like the one-liner that I showed you, like the log line. I just want to know what that is right now. Because when you're not, when you've not heard a story before, your brain is, you know, working overtime trying to figure it out. And if you make me like struggle to do that as you little by little give me different pieces of information you know good luck with that but if you immediately tell me why this is an important story that i need to know about and need to read then okay my brain is what receptive and then i may start asking you questions if you did a good job with that pitch and, and don't worry about everything else you cannot get all the detail of your story across in a five minute pitch session and uh, you should have your story sold. I'm sorry this is, sounds a little tough, but you should have your story sold in the first 60 seconds of the session. You don't have to tell me who you are, where you're from, what your background is, what led you to write the story. I, I'm a busy person in an industry that is looking for stories. We're not looking for all that stuff. We're looking for that stuff only if we start to like you because we love your storytelling. So what writers are constantly coming to LA and wanting to have lunch. Well. I get a lot of lunch, you know, and, 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 and my Kyoko makes the best tuna fish salad in the universe. So I'd much rather stay home and eat, you know, lunch with her than to go to a lunch paid for by a writer. I don't know. But if I, so I want to write your, read your story first. If I read your story and love it, then we can talk about that. But mostly just because I've been around so long, I don't have lunch with writers until we sold something. And then I really want to get to know them because they're, they've been sold and you know that's, that's good. So you just want to sell me immediately when you walk in and, and tell me what the story's about. And if you don't know that yet, then maybe you're not ready to pitch yet. Uh, it, it's, you've got to know what your story's about. There's a brilliant book called The Art of Dramatic Writing, which I recommend to everyone who writes by a man named Lajos Agri, E-G-R-I. And it, it talks about the premise of your story. The premise is the one sentence that describes your story and that you need to know before you sit down to edit your first draft. Because if the first draft is the first draft, it means nothing. But you have to, after the first draft, figure out what your story was about and be able to say it in one sentence. And then you put that sentence above your computer and you go back and edit the story and take out everything in your story that isn't about this sentence. And that's called the premise. He used Macbeth as an example. Your overwhelming ambition leads to self-destruction. So he takes out the scene, you know, about Bottom having a dream of being an ass and you know running through the woods with fairies. And he goes, that doesn't illustrate the premise of this play. So I'm going to save it for another play. And, and that's that premise is what you pitch first. This is a story about a man who was left behind on Mars. And, and, and oh, okay, I'm interested. Not anymore, of course, but I, I would have been interested <laughs> two years ago. So, good luck with that. Uh,